Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today I'm joined by the Seed Sisters, that's Kazla Goodweather and Fiona Heckles, and they're back for their second time on the show. I think you're one of the few guests that have come back for a second time, so really excited to catch up with you two. Uh, how you two doing? Yeah, really lovely to be back. It's um, nice to, to reconnect, so thank you for inviting us. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great to be back. It's lovely to be back in this cozy zone with you chatting plants welcome to the herbalist hour this is where community gather merging the power of people and the flowers the sweet and the bitter to the salty the sour oh mommy it's time for the herbalist hour yeah people really enjoyed that first episode that we did um and we talked a bit about your last book. I want to say it's the Sensory Herbal or the Sensory Herbalism book. Uh, but y'all sent me a new book. I want to say it came out in 2022 called Poison Prescriptions, which is a pretty sexy title. I'm not going to lie. Um, I was trained very um, in my herbal school, very um, conservatively. We didn't really talk anything about these poison plants, so to speak, or I want to say you might even call them in the book uh, power herbs or witchy herbs, um, if I'm getting that correct. But yeah, I'm excited to delve further after perusing this book quite a bit yesterday. I'm, I got to say, I'm really excited about this conversation. Got some fun questions for you. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about the new book, Poison Prescriptions? Yeah, we can. And in here in the UK, the herbs that we've written about in this book are on a special register they're called the schedule 20s and that register was set up in the 60s in the late 60s and they are our native european plants sometimes called the witching herbs but the ones that we focused on are the solanaceae family so within the nightshade family and we were very, very lucky because when we did our herbalism training, we were still being trained by an older generation of herbalists who were very, um, very familiar with these plants because they'd been part of their Materia Medica because they'd all been practicing before the 1968 Medicine Act came in. But as that generation of herbalists retired, um, the herbal medicine training courses became much poorer in our opinion because people weren't teaching about these very, very important, potent medicines. And we've given it the name Poison Prescriptions, which was a little bit tongue in cheek because For they sure. are known as the poisons. But as we all know, you know, anything can be a poison. It's about dosage. And that's that's kind of the the bit with it is that you know some of our most potentially powerful poisons are also some of the most potentially powerful medicines so kind of marrying that idea of prescriptions and poisons together kind of to us really um depicted the the these herbs in particular well um, but it's been an incredible journey that we've been on working with these plants, but also researching them and talking to fellow herbalists. And we really wanted to put something out there that could help to support the revival of these really important plants, but with as much knowledge and information out there. And um, we'd really seen that there'd been this almost... Um, pushing down of the information around yeah. them and an increase in fear around working with them. And we just wanted to address that balance a little bit with this piece of work. So the book's been out for at least a year now. How has the um, audience reception been thus far? Have you seen like an, an increase in the popularity of, of using these plants in the particular ways you talk about in the book? Well, since we've, the, the very first piece of work that we did about these family, about this family of plants was with a herbal medicine charity in the UK. It's called mm. Heartwood and they run a professional training now. And mm. at the time, one of their directors invited us to come and put together a series of podcasts about the plants. And he was the one who really encouraged us, Nick Rowley, really, mm. really encouraged us to write this book. But since we began the work with him, 
what we've noticed is that there is an increase of clinical herbalists who are bringing these herbs back into their practices. And we're not the only medical herbalists that have been doing this work. Um, Chan Chow Cabrera, who's I think you've spoken to on oh, yeah. Herb as well, um, lectures about the Schedule 20s as well. And there's other herbalists who are talking about them because I think as a as a community, we've recognised the importance of reviving this education and this information. Yeah, I guess we'll. Oh, yeah, go for it, please. Sorry. Uh, yeah, there was a there was um an an interesting um flow of interest in these plants, and we so we've been working with them ourselves in practice, but also personal connections with the plants for you know, 25 odd years. And it was really interesting that at the time that the book came out, suddenly there was this sort of cross globe interest seemed to suddenly be exploding. And we had to do some research for the publishers to, to tell them which other books on the subject were out there, which led us down the sort of having a good look at what was there. And there was lots of other books that were either from a historical perspective or a witchy perspective. And there wasn't many that bridged this gap between the medicine and the magic. But what there was was several books at the same time that were creating, that, you know, were they answering the call of people becoming interested or was there suddenly this uprising of people like myself and Kaz that suddenly felt more confident to put this knowledge out there? Um, so it, you know, there was, it's been this really interesting kind of um, look at society and what society may or may not be ready for, or may or may not be interested in. Yeah, uh, I was telling you pre-call that I was just listening to a podcast that you two were in. I want to say it was called the Innerverse Podcast. If I'm getting that correct, I'll leave a link in the podcast show notes. Uh, but just reading the comments, it really seemed like a lot of people, I don't think that podcast is necessarily specifically herbal related, but every reading all the comments, everyone in there seems super interested in the book. Some people picked it up, but they just seemed super excited about the topic. So, um, Kaz, you mentioned a podcast, a series of podcasts you two did. Is that available um, for free somewhere or is that do you have to, behind a paywall or? It's part of, um, we created it for Heartwood's education, so it's not available. It's gotcha. still it's at the moment I think it's still in creation because oh what happened was with Hartwood we we created it pre-pandemic but during the pandemic as many of us know online learning became very easy and Hartwood had launched their online courses so they got completely overwhelmed with running an online herbal medicine training so I think there's there's things in the backlog that will happen yeah, um, there's a bank of recordings, isn't there, waiting to be <laughs> produced oh, wow. to a, a course there. But, but we I, have produced our own course that goes alongside Poison Prescriptions. We've been producing it for the last year and we'll be letting that out to the world in the next few months. That's awesome. I didn't realize that. So, dear listener, go sign up for the Seed Sisters newsletter. Uh, we'll leave links to that in the podcast show notes as per usual. Um, sweet. I had no idea there was going to be a course kind of based around the book. That's a great idea, though. Yeah, people um, want to see moving images and, <laughs> you know, feel into it a bit more as well, especially when you're working with these sort. There's so many, you know, even nettle can be mistaken so easily for dead nettle. Or a course we were running the other day, we sent folk out to dig up dandelion roots and a lot of them came back with hawks bit. You know, it's so easy okay, yeah. to misidentify plants unless you're really familiar with them. So, you know, we really, that's really what we want out of this is for people to feel connected to the actual plants. That's what I'm excited to talk to you too about because uh, you strongly emphasize throughout the book to grow your own, sustainably harvest your own, as opposed to just going out and buying these dried herbs per se in the herb shop, which I'm sure there's, you know, benefit to that as well. But I, I really love that your um, emphasis on connection to nature in the book. Um, so before we continue, 
I'm going to do a little cover my ass and it's uh, I'm going to kind of read a portion of your note of caution. I don't I won't read the whole thing because that might just take too long. Uh, so, dear listener, uh, this book intends to educate but does not prescribe treatment for any ailments. Be self-aware, self-respectful and conscious of all risks associated with these powerful plants. Consult with your practitioner before experimenting with herbs, especially if you are taking medication. Uh, be sure to understand the herb jugger interactions beforehand and always be cautious in pregnancy or while breastfeeding. Uh, so again, I won't read the whole thing, but um, on page 14, you say, as mentioned in the cautionary note of the start of this book, the witching herbs are very strong psychotropics, potential poisons that can bring on strong hallucinations when taken in large doses. We do not work with them in this way, nor do we advocate others to do so. We work them in a, on a much more subtle levels, such as by growing these wonderful allies and adding them to our balms using only relatively minute doses. We are much more interested in the energetics of these herbs and how we can use to, them to support and promote healthy lifestyles and relationships, both with our own kind and with the plant themselves. So now after I just read all of that um do either of you have any feedback on say the words of caution or kind of what to expect from the book well like you just mentioned the way that we want to promote people connecting is safely we want people to have um a good experience and the way that we've had the most enriching experiences is by growing the plants and we also understand that not everyone has access to land. So something that we've done with our social enterprise, the business that we run, is promote and support community growing projects. And something that we've seen again and again in a community garden, there's a lot of fear about planting herbs that are so-called poisons. So mm. to navigate lots of different um, issues that can come up around that. But for people to actually bring the seeds and even before that where are you getting your seeds from and we've tried really hard within our community to have seed sharing and when people grow these plants to be able to um, connect with others and say I've got the chura seeds or henbane seeds and I've grown the plant here in this kind of aspect and um, in this kind of soil so that we can really begin to understand where the plant generationally has come from and then the, it starts with looking at the seeds and we invite people to bring the seeds onto a space we like to create altars where we can sit and look at the seeds really observe them and think about what and how we want to grow the plants for to before even before we put the seed into the soil because if you're growing these plants, there is a responsibility to yourself, to other people around you and to the plants that you're beginning this relationship with care and respect. But it is it's just amazing to be able to grow your plants, all your herbs. It's a real privilege to see those first little germinating seed leaves and how a plant develops and over time, beginning to understand because these plants travel themselves a lot of them you know you put them in a garden and they can be in a south facing corner for years and then decide no I'm going to move and go somewhere a lot more shady as they self-seed and germinate and you can really see that these are conscious sentient beings they're not um you know the the language that we've all been brought up with going to school in the UK in English is we talk about a plant as it and we talk about their uses and that really kind of creates a divide a separation because of our words and by yeah by growing them I think you begin to break that down and actually have an embodied experience with the plants. But also to say you know these these plants are used in clinical medicine as well and um you know the schedule 20 in the uk says that it's only practitioners that can prescribe these herbs and by that 
you know, we take that to mean that it's someone that has experienced these plants and the dosages and where that edge is between the dose being too large. But in combination with other herbs, these these herbs are used in asthma, in Parkinsonian tremors, in gut spasm, in pain relief, in sciatica. You know, there's a vast array of applications for these plants within medicine. Mm. And we're really interested in reviving that within clinical practice for herbalists, as well as this deeper spiritual connection with the plants that if you're not confident or trained in how to combine herbs and why you might and where they might be appropriate to use and where not, then this is the route in is to connect. And even if you are using them medicinally, you know, we all say we would never give a herb to anyone that isn't a plant that we've seen growing or that we can connect with in some way. Otherwise, you know, you become disconnected from the medicine that you're giving out. So, um, yeah, there's there's that caution for a person coming to this with fresh eyes, but there's also um, a, a, an encouragement of herbalists to get educated and learn about the dosages, the the strengths of the tinctures, the lengths of time the plants can be taken for and in what situations they're appropriate or applicable in. And and also the spiritual applications of them, because as clinical herbalists, we're not separate from taking people on a journey with a plant, with the spirit or the connection with the plant as well. So, yeah, I think there's two different sides to that caution. Totally. And you've talked about the magic of growing the plant and I've always been one of those herbalists that really didn't have a garden. You know, most yeah. of my herbalism took place in the old growth forest out in Western Cascades, Oregon. But Amanda has really spearheaded uh, starting a garden in our new yard, which is uh, we have the privilege of having a yard, but it's also only 0.1 acre. So it's been fun to watch her develop and plan and, and start growing these plants. And I got to tell you, the excitement of seeing that calendula pop up for the first time. Oh, my goodness. It just you get so giddy when you see the plants out there. And just every time you see it in the yard, you're just like, oh, that's so amazing. Like the magic of it all. So I totally vibe with that. Um, yeah. And it doesn't need to be a kick ass hallucinogenic plant to give right. you that absolute buzz of a connection to have it growing you know um, or have them growing around you and um yeah but you know i will say if you grow a a detura inside for example if you're ever sleeping near one of these plants growing you you do know about it in the dream space because you know they are so powerfully potent with their with the aroma and the, you know, the perfume that they put out is in itself really intoxicating. Um, so yeah, just they're, they're, they're buddies that don't leave you alone at night. <laughs> so you're actually growing Datura inside. Um, is that available for most people? So because we live in the UK and we get yeah. quite a, um, a cold, damp, winter that can be frosty, Datura inoxia serves as a wonderful indoor plant and we wow. cultivate Datura inoxia and have done for many years inside. That's rad. Uh, you get a lot of, um, in the States, you get a lot of Datura metal, slightly different species okay. um, growing wild. I think they do the same as our Stramonium here. So the Stramonium that grows wild and outside in the UK just does its whole cycle in a year. And then the fresh plant, the new plant growth comes from the seeds, whereas the Anoxia live on through the cycles, but they prefer a warmer clime. Um, and the Datura metal, um, we get less of wild here, but I think you get more of that in the States. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a feeling Amanda would be really into growing that indoor. And it's actually flowering too uh, yeah. when you're, wow, okay. Flowering with the moons, we've got them and each full moon we get a new bloom. <laughs> That's amazing. So that is that the one, is Datura the one also called moonflower? Yeah. Okay, nice. Or Jimson weed. Oh yeah, I've heard of that one for sure. Yeah. Um, 
Carlos Castaneda, I want to say, talked about that yeah. quite a bit in his books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned growing, um, if you don't have a yard growing in like, say a public garden. Um, I just wanted to touch on that briefly. Cause yeah, I was thinking, would these things spread, uh, to other garden plots? Are people actually concerned about it? I guess it depends on where you're at in the world, but, um, yeah, I just am picturing growing, you know, deter and all these other, uh, power plants and how it'd be looked at by other folks. So I'm just curious if you could, uh, touch on that a little bit more. Yeah, it's really fascinating because the the kind of archetypal cottage garden is always painted or drawn and you see the foxglove, the digitalis growing, and they're cultivated a lot in the UK. And um there's and they're just accepted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no kind of discussion. But people generally know that digitalis is a very potent plant. But when you introduce something like Datura into the discussions, there is a lot more fear and and conversation around it because Datura has historically been ripped up by the police in the UK for being a problematic plant. So having that kind of background historically means that people don't recognise the plant. It's not... Um, you know, depicted in art as much. And it's very interesting because we've got a public garden very close to here. It's um, a beautiful old um, house and a famous site of a Victorian botanist. And in that public mm -hmm. garden, which is open to, the, to, the, to everybody, they've got loads of belladonna just growing in amongst everything. They've got Datura popping up and when we first visited there we were just like who's the gay gardener here because you know it's a <laughs> space and you get little kids running around and there's no signs or anything like that and it felt really um it felt like a really good thing because it puts responsibility back to us as individuals and really we don't want children or pets going and just nibbling all plants anyway we want to have some kind of education for the wider society to to be aware that there are certain plants there there always will be and there always has been certain things that you need caution around and because we as humans need to have caution why does that mean that these plants have to be banned from public spaces so it's it's a very fine line and it can be um, it's a huge conversation, but it, more than often, it's about the individuals running the space. Because when we found the head gardener of Middleton House Gardens here in North London, he was just adamant that the plants had been grown there for a very, very long time. And it was up to the individuals coming to the gardens to educate themselves. I think it's... I think it's back to that with the education, isn't it? Because, you know, it's ch times are changing, but certainly we live in a society where children aren't brought up with foraging as a normal part of their lives, certainly here in the UK. And the idea our children know if they pick something up, what's this? Can I eat it? You know, it's not a, a dive straight in. I think if you're part of a foraging culture, then that becomes more of a norm to question things beforehand. But we're in a society where that's not a norm, which is why work like ours is very important to get the messages out there, more information about how to forage carefully, how to bring children into it. Um, but like Kaz said, you know, there's yew trees growing all over the place that looks quite similar to pine to the untrained eye that you could easily pull a bit off and start nibbling it and you know if you're if you're little find yourself in quite a bit of trouble and so that that education side of it is is kind of the key but we went to a garden we were running a workshop on the flying ointment which i'm sure we're going to get onto yeah. in switzerland in geneva and right behind the artist studios that we were running the workshop in there was a community garden behind it, quite a big space with local people working in it. And we went down and into the garden 
and there was one bed that had pretty much every herb, not just the Solanaceae, but also the adjuncts that we use within that blend in one bed within this garden. And I was just completely blown away, A, that it was in a community garden, B, that it had those plants in it, because there's such a lack of it here. And I couldn't find who planted them or, you know, <laughs> and um, <laughs> my... Uh, my language wasn't uh, perfect to be communicating, so I ended up just saying, "I, you know, I love your garden." But um, <laughs> it was, um, it you know, it was just fascinating that there and there was children um, over the other side gardening with people, and there was no fence around it or warning signs, and I just thought this is really interesting, you know, that culturally or within that garden, you know, maybe people are given an induction or who knows, but that there's. People aren't just going up and eating those plants there. There was henbane, there was datura, there was belladonna growing in that garden. So, yeah. And you're right, we will get into the flying ointment. So the flying ointment uh, contains all three henbane, datura, belladonna. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Okay, cool. Nice. Well, well, we'll wait a little bit to get into that. But um, uh, first, I want to brag for, uh, for your book. Uh, you have a you have a ton of endorsements at the very beginning, and I was just going to read a couple if you don't mind. Uh, you mentioned Chanchel Cabrera, which I highly respect and love this herbalist, and um, she's got a really great endorsement at the beginning. Uh, so Chanchel writes, "This is a treasure of a book, full of gems and precious words of wisdom, delving deep into a dark subject and shining light on old practices and traditional knowledge." A textbook, a storybook, a book for clinicians and the curious lay reader alike, engrossing and engaging with beautiful photographs and illustrations throughout. Poison prescriptions is a feast for the eyes as well as a source of important clinical information. I shall be referencing uh, back to this book again and again. Also, uh, quickly read uh, Rosemary Gladstar. Also wrote a really lovely endorsement. The seed sisters are at it again, spreading the good word of the herb gathering our gracious green allies and telling their stories so eloquently. I hope this new book travels far out into the world like a wild, tenacious seed. And I was actually just emailing with uh, Rosemary the other day, and I mentioned I was going to be interviewing you two, and she's like, oh, I absolutely love the Seed Sisters and what they're doing. So, uh, dear listener, please do pick up Poison Prescriptions. Um, I'm going to forget the website, seedsisters.co.uk. Did I get it? Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> I should have had that written out already, but um, you don't need to comment on the endorsements if you don't want to, but um, I just, I was, yeah, blown away by who you got to write endorsements as well as just, yeah, just a, a great uh, little bit about the book right there. So um, why don't we go on and talk about kind of how the book is laid out. Uh, so the book is laid out in three parts from what I could tell. Um, and I was maybe thinking we could go over like each of the sections and I'll just kind of read out each section and we could talk a little bit about what lies within. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Cool. So the three parts, the first part is the path of poisons. Uh, so what is in this section? <laughs> Are you going to test our brain memory? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought you were going to carry on then, but that was, a, I thought that was a rhetorical question. Oh, <laughs> shoot. Okay. Well, then how about this? No, no, just... no, it's fine. Okay. We, can... <laughs> we can answer it. Um, sure. <laughs> so the first part is um, really looking at um, magical practices with plants, how you can connect plants into your magical practice. And we're looking at some historical references and mainly at the way that we work with herbs in different ways and also how you can prepare physically mentally and environmentally for doing ritual magic is kind of setting the scene for um conscious awareness especially when working with herbs that are as powerful as these and we have at, yeah we have a look at a little bit of the lunar transits and how mm -hmm. astrology also impacts some of our work and because later on in the book we've got a particular recipe that we suggest is worked through 
lunar cycles and uh, we also look at being a detective because we often think of ourselves as clinical herbalists as being detectives because we need these acute keen observational skills when we're working with patients but we apply those same observational skills to the plants and we make suggestions to people about how they can begin to develop those skills for things like drawing and mm. creating folklore and story for themselves about the plants. I think we also talk in that section about hexing and um, sort of views on magic and approaches to magic and a lot of those ideas around the fear that still resides in magic and that you don't have to be confined by other people's prescriptions of magic and if your candle's not blue it's all right or if you <laughs> you know if facing east doesn't seem right and you want to face west then go for it you know just that you can bring your own imagination into magical practice and that it can be an expression of creativity um but that there are some helpful practices that help to contain and focus magical practice around focused intention setting the scene um mm. you know the stages of it rather than being extremely prescriptive although we do also offer rituals and practices that you can do because sometimes when you're new to practices having guidelines and a structure is really helpful that you can work through and get to an end point and once you've learned other ways of practicing you can then smash that apart a bit and bring your own flair to them so we do offer practices within it as well suggestions just reminds me a lot of like cooking you know you got to start somewhere so you got to follow the recipe but eventually you develop your own style I love that and I love the that's the seed sisters approach I've heard you talk a lot about um how you have like say a punk background a DIY background and you kind of just do your own thing whatever the intuition is telling you to do and um I really admire that and but yeah you got to start somewhere so if a lot of the stuff is new to you like you said there's a lot of recipes so to speak in the book to get you started mm -hmm. um so the second section to test your memory again is uh connecting to the witching herbs what's that all about that's where we begin to introduce this family the nightshade or solanaceae family and have a look at, at a bit more of their phytochemical constituents and especially the alkaloids and how these specific alkaloids interact with our neurology and nervous system um we get a bit geeky with some information there that chemists might enjoy and clinicians might enjoy and then we delve a lot deeper into the individual plants so we have almost like you know mini chapters on each of the datura hembane and the belladonna it's like an ode to each one of those plants looking at their history worldwide um our experiences with them like the sensory herbal approach homeopathy um how they're worked with in clinical herbalism how they've been used actually in pharmaceutical medicine historically as well so each one has all of those sections within it so that you know it's trying to give this really broad clear picture of each herb and then lots of beautiful artwork that's been created by silver who is a fabulous friend and artist who actually created a lot of the inks from the plants and worked with them very wow. magically to create the artwork as well and um yeah it's a real that that section's like the real love of the herbs using through it hopefully within, within that awesome. section we've also included um, information about what to do if you do accidentally overdose so oh. we talk about dosages and we've mentioned that before and you know 
everything is a poison dependent on the dose. So understanding the um, the way the tinctures are created and then how much of the tinctures are kind of the standard acceptable dose. And if you did take too much of that, what you could do um, to alleviate some of the symptoms while you got yourself off to get proper treatment, because you know, that's a really important part as well. And it's something that we learned experientially for ourselves because I actually poisoned myself while I was at university with black cohosh, oh. <laughs> oh, wow. which is a herb that I've never gone near since I took. Um, <laughs> I was at work working in a dispensary and took a, a whacking dose of simisifuga. And on the drive home, my vision just shut down and I, I phoned. Wow. I was like, I've poisoned myself. You need to heal me. And through that protocol, you know, by working with bentonite clay to chelate, working with various different green juices, reflexology points, you know, experientially, we learn about ways that you can self-manage a poisoning before you got other treatment. Or before it becomes really damaging as well. I mean, the thing with black cohosh was that you know, that was like a physical poisoning for Kaz. Um, and we did, it did, you know, you did come around pretty quick relatively <laughs> from it. <laughs> but with the um, with the Solanaceae and we talk about it in there, you know, as well as some of the physical symptoms that can happen um, when you take too much, like a frighteningly dry mouth that you can't quench your thirst and um hot skin um you know feeling really dry um the heart racing but you know you might you, the muscles can be quite relaxed in a severe kind of delirium state you can have hallucination this is why we don't refer to these plants as psychedelics you can experience hallucinations but unlike things like you know classic psychedelic drugs like lsd or magic mushrooms or something like that you're experiencing an altered state of consciousness but you're not necessarily aware that you're experiencing it it's like you're in it and it's reality and that's part of the reason why we believe there's so much mythology connected with these plants because it's like they're revealing innate parts of like ourselves or our kind of you know, almost archetypal ancestral stuff that was going on there because it's real in that moment rather than here's something I'm experiencing that I know will come round from. And that can be a very frightening place for people. Um, so that's, the, you know, that's the that's the caution with why we call, why we, we don't refer to them as psychedelics. And... It takes a lot um, and you're more than likely to to have this like unquenchable thirst, et cetera, before you get into that real state. That's often seen in intoxications where people have smoke loads or eaten loads and have managed a huge, a vast dose of it. But it doesn't take a lot to have wildly vivid feelings and experiences with them. And, you know, that's we'll talk next about the next um, yeah. chapter, but um, that's why we work with these in very specific ways when we're talking about connection and um, altering perception. You mentioned smoking herbs and another solanaceous, solanaceous plant is a uh, tobacco. I want to say on page 76, you talk a little bit about the, the usage of tobacco, which I believe falls into part two of the book. Uh, can you briefly touch on how tobacco is used? Um, and uh, I don't know, can it talk about tobacco and I guess in the terms of like the the magical uses of plants that you're talking about throughout the book? Yeah. To just to, before you come in there, Kaz, um, tobacco is actually one that's in gardens all over. Mm. Loads of people have tobacco plants growing in their gardens and they don't even realise that they've oh. got tobacco plants growing. So that's another. Yeah. And their beautiful foliage and these lovely 
pale flowers so you see them a lot in gardens as ornamentals <laughs> but yeah. yes tobacco tobacco is such an interesting plant because many of us were introduced to tobacco as teenagers because it was really cool to smoke because you looked <laughs> up and you got a little hit and it was very normal when I was growing up that you know, 14, 13, 14 year olds all crowded around the local tobacconist and we'd be smoking. I personally was into Marlboro because I loved the adverts of the American cowboy, you know. Uh -huh. It was only later when I started mixing with people who were really into native american culture so here in the uk in the 90s there was a huge kind of movement of people who wanted to live like native american tribes so they lived in teepees they still do there's an area in wales which is one of the oh. wettest places in the uk where people live um and at that time there was you know, there's a lot of appropriation that went on before the word appropriation was in the lexicon. But I sat round fires where people were talking about grandfather tobacco. Mm. And I was always, you know, curious and saying, you know, what's that about? So digging into a bit of the history and reading about peace pipes and my understanding, because I've never experienced any traditional ritual with people of the land where it comes from. But my understanding is that tobacco is a gateway, is an opener. That's my experience of tobacco. So when I've smoked tobacco, I've felt um, an excitement in my tissues because I'm not addicted to tobacco. So if I have a smoke, I can feel this rush and opening and um, lots of energy going to my head. And when we've looked at mugwort, Artemisia mm. vulgaris, Artemisia was what was smoked here in Europe before nicotinum arrived on these lands. And mugwort is also very much an opener and a gateway exploration herb. So we felt that they've they've got a lot of similarities. There's a lot of things that feel um like these herbs have got some kind of connection but we don't smoke tobacco we don't bring tobacco into any of our ritual work but we do bring mugwort in because we cultivate and have mugwort growing all around us and we enjoy mixing mugwort with other herbs to smoke as well mm. and it was our mentor actually it was christopher headley that first talked about smoking herbs as medicine he was saying that at one stage he was working with mental health patients in a hospital setting and when people were really really agitated he'd give them a few lavender flowers to mix into their tobacco roll-ups and it was interesting to think about herbs actually used clinically to affect different shifts because coltsfoot, of course, is another famous smoking herb, but I find it quite disgusting and I've never prescribed coltsfoot for people to smoke. Because um, we like to experiment and work with the herbs ourselves. And we ended up developing a blend, which was mugwort, elderflower, marshmallow mm -hmm. leaf and peppermint leaf. And in equal quantities, that became our absolute favourite blend I and mean, lovely to smoke because we really enjoy smoking pipes. And the way that we have our smoking rituals is we open harvesting. So before we go to connect and harvest the plant, we smoke a pipe, often in groups with other people or just by ourselves to represent this moment in time where we are shifting just very gently our consciousness to be able to be aware of what we're doing with the plant to be able to commune in some way to let the plants know we've come to harvest them 
we're asking if it's okay to harvest them and really feel a bit more sensitive. We went like to, that, yeah, we went to, um, we've done a lot of work around mugwort because she's a plant we work with so much. And the Anglo Saxon text, the Laknunga, calls her Una the first. And mm. it's just quite interesting with that idea of the opening and the gateway in. And, you know, as, as teenagers, I don't know if your teen teens in the States do this, but you know, you would used to like scrape banana skins and use dried oregano and you know, it's it's something that is within teens to want to smoke and experiment. And you know, mugwort has no tar, um, well, less tar than tobacco, no nicotine, it's completely non-addictive but has this gentle connection with that kind of pineal gland, melatonin kind of wakes sleep cycle, putting you into this gentle waking dream state. And once you find her growing on the waysides, it's really the traveler's herb, you know, lining the wayside and so abundant. And even to be able to point teens <laughs> in that, you know, of a certain age or whatever, as they're getting interested in that, to something that they can actually connect with in a different way that's much less harmful is, you know, it's an interesting idea of how to support our teens with exploration rather than um, sending them out into a world where what's available is quite destructive and harmful for them. And, yeah, we love the stories of the the namesake Artemisia, Artemis connected with the mugwort and that protector of small children and, you know, the huntress in the forest, but also the one that if the hunters are taking too much, will go and have a word with them and take them out if they're affecting the balance within the forest and that it's this real kind of balance of nature and... um yeah, just there's so much special power within mugwort that you're connecting with all of that when you bring her into ceremonies. I'm very fond of mugwort. I actually grew it in my uh, yard in Oregon. And when we sold our house, uh, we, we grew all these weedy herbs and we like mowed everything down. And <laughs> I'm just like picturing the next owners inheriting this like giant stand of mugwort, which I absolutely love. But um, uh, I dream a lot every night I have for as long as I can remember. Uh, I could see how smoking mugwort would produce this like wonderful dreamlike waking state during the day. I'm honestly concerned about using it for myself for dreaming because I already do it so much. But I want to say Howie Brownstein was talking about maybe it was mugwort or maybe it was a different dreamer about how it kind of takes you to the next level of a dream state, which I guess does appeal to me. But part of me wants to just have a night where I just am zonked out and don't have any dreams because I wonder if it'd be more resting. But uh, I don't know if you have any follow-up thoughts on that. But yeah, absolutely adore mugwort. I was just thinking, like, when you crave a night without dreams, sometimes I find that's skullcap for me. I, when I take skullcap, I imagine I put on mm. one of the leather skullcaps and it just keeps everything quiet. So, oh, that's... Great. That's a great analogy. Okay. Maybe I should try a skullcap. <laughs> See how it dreams with you. <laughs> totally. We often say that the mugwort helps you to connect with your dreams more so to kind of understand the the messaging and the patterning within them. But there is, you know, we've both experienced it over longer periods of doing a lot of dream work that that kind of dream state physical reality starts to blur a bit and that you get in a state where sometimes you don't know if you've dreamt something or if it was in this physical reality you know not to say that the dream state is not real but that we do have to exist in this physical reality as well and sometimes if you're you're blurring that a lot it, you know it can become the realities get enmeshed so we tend to dream for certain periods of time with specific um, 
reasons for dreaming or, you know, um, questions to be answered or problem solving or to connect in a certain way or for healing or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. Yeah. In your book, you mentioned a Christopher Headley quote where if you're dealing with a problem, he said you should dream on it. Did I get that right? Yeah. Set yeah. your intention. Yeah. yeah. Very awesome. Awesome. Nice. Well, uh, the third segment is the flying ointment, which I want to say is kind of like the recipe section. But um, why don't you tell us what's in the flying ointment section of the book? The flying ointment is, again, actually, we'd already been working with these plants, but we were introduced to the concept of the flying ointment by Christopher Headley, mm. who rubbed belladonna flying ointment on our pulse points uh, a herbalist gathering in the Midlands of England as the full moon was rising and the mist was gathering over the fields and the tent had a, a Scottish Cayley band <laughs> blasting out Cayley music and he rubbed the, the belladonna ointment and swang us and we swang each other like like dervishing kind of spirals and we entered into this complete altered state and it was a whole weekend of working with the energetics of herbs and really getting to understand and know herbs it was very formative in a lot of our peers at that time um development of our practices and it was at, at that time he spoke about herbalism being a broad church mm. that there's so many different ways to practice with herbs and we started to explore recipes and ideas and the history of what the flying ointment was and the kind of myth or the story around the flying ointment is that it's this preparation made from a green oil because a lot of the alkaloids that are in those solanaceae plants create like a rich green oil we make a hot often make a hot oil infusion with them and that green oil is turned into this unguent that is a wonderful sciatic treatment for externally for pain, for toothache, but also when applied to the mucous membranes of the vagina, the nostrils, up your bum, creates this, it, it misses going into the bloodstream is the same way as if you take it orally. It goes straight into the bloodstream and misses out going through the liver. So you get the alkaloids straight into your bloodstream and this instantaneous connection to the plants that are contained within them. And not only that, but astonishingly within what seems like a quite a simple principle you have things like the alkaloids that are found in the plants are are alkaline in nature and alkaline substances pass over the mucous membranes more readily and more easily so you need even less doses of them to initiate the responses and the sense and the connection with those herbs creates this sense of flight which has been associated with the witches flying on their broomsticks to the sabbats to celebrations to reach these altered states and have these celebratory parties <laughs> around a fire and possibly a big vat of of flying ointment and we just loved those stories and started to experiment and play and create and work with the ointment ourselves and, you know, just imagined ourselves on this 20-year flight of a broomstick that we've been on 25 mm -hmm. years, flying through time and <laughs> with these plants. And, you know, here we are today talking about it to you. So cool. yeah, we set about having an annual community gathering where mm -hmm. we would co-create the ointment with whoever came and we did that around Samhain we did that in the winter times and year on year our recipes developed because we were 
traveling a lot. We've got a caravan and vans and we travel around different music festivals and green fairs. And so as we traveled the country, we'd find patches of belladonna or one year we found swathes of foxglove and we introduced foxglove into the balm. And every year the recipe would slightly shift and change. And we kind of got, we, we got into feeling what felt safe, what felt good. For example, the foxglove was far too strong and mm. we discontinued foxglove in the balm. And we've never, ever put hemlock in the balm, although we've been around a lot of hemlock and we've come close and started feeling the energetics and feeling the plant. It's always been like a, a big step back and no. But over these 20 years and working with lots and lots of different people and then finally meeting and Mary, an old woman in Cornwall who gave us an old recipe of one of her ancestors, we developed what we have written about in the book, this particular recipe. And there's other herbs in that balm as well. There's herbs like St. John's wort, there's herbs like yarrow and rose and it's and marshmallow, herbs to help support softening, to support the nervous system, to support the digestion. So that even, even though we are taking very small doses, we're still thinking about protection we always work with milk thistle before we take the bar we always think about how we can support our own livers and everybody's livers around us before you're taking something that's going to put a bit of extra stress on all of your organs of elimination just like mm. having a cup of strong coffee does but right. it's you know, it's a conscious awareness of um tr working to introduce this level of consciousness to communities and as we sit in circle with all of the people every year and they bring the herbs into the oil and we stir it into the cauldron we ask them to bring their own words and their own intentions and it's always around responsibility in community because the biggest thing that we feel is part of our responsibility as humans part of our duty is to create a different paradigm and that's huge it sounds really big <laughs> but you know working magically we can begin to vision a utopia a utopian society and just visioning that without kind of real thought and process is a bit flippant so we're really feeling into what what does it mean and there's all these buzzwords like community. It's a big buzzword. But what does it actually mean to us as individuals? What do what do we want from a community? What can we bring to a community? What is our part in co-creating that? And over the years, it's become more and more nuanced. This year was just mind blowing because we had quite a few people who were deep cats. We had some psychotherapists on the course who brought a whole extra kind of uh, load of words and thought to it we had it was a longer it was a longer event this year though it was a, a weekend retreat exploring deeply the energetics of each herb and the you know the yeah it was like a an elongated process often we do it over a a long day but it was really beautiful to be able to dive more deeply with people that came along and work in that way and as a result and with the people that were on it this year yeah this idea of community got yeah really the realities of community and the messiness of community with people and individuals and people that carry their traumas with them into community and how that impacts on the group and and actually you know what these herbs are as we've talked about is they have this chaotic edge to them and you know you can 
you can try and have an ideal of community or an ideal of a journey with one of these herbs, but you also have to be prepared that it's going to take a, potentially a lot of strength and will to face certain aspects of society or yourself or community. And yeah, it's really interesting this year what's come out of the balm creation and how that's going to affect this next batch really <laughs> so this is a event you're going to do every year or that you already do do every year yeah yeah really. okay. yeah early <laughs> event sounds... here in the uk in a um usually in some sort of special castle or stately home somewhere <laughs> do you mind so... if i list that on the events the international events page on herb rally oh please do yeah absolutely i'll definitely yeah. do that well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts about the book um, or anything else you're working on that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, yeah, we've been working on creating an online membership, which is actually our coven, our coven mm -hmm. of herbal secrets, because we realize that what people really benefit from when they're getting interested in plants or magic is knowing that other people are there to support you and that you're not a total weirdo and <laughs> there's a, a vast supportive community of plant lovers out there, like the good work that you're doing as well, connecting people together. And yeah, so we've created this beautiful online space of um, lots of different portals of different areas with like a huge backlog of learning in there but also community groups and live sessions and events so that'd be really lovely or we've got our newsletters our weekly newsletters as well we give out loads of free info and seasonal stuff as well as more general information on those so lots of ways to come and get in touch and say hello with us and another project that we've been involved in is actually personifying the herbs and it was something that we got involved with as part of a COP26 project. So when COP26 was in Glasgow, one of our students was undertaking a pilgrimage, walking all the way up the spine of Albion to Glasgow in Scotland from the Isle of Wight. And as part of that pilgrimage, we were commissioned to make a series of films called Voices from the Hedgerow where we donned amazing costumes made by another friend and took on the personas of the plants. And these were aimed at families who were just getting out, you know, it was lockdown times, and showing them some of their really familiar plants like blackberry or apple. And we had such good fun and we got such brilliant feedback that we ended up taking fruity climate comedy on the road dressed as apple and damson and it's something that we are really keen to develop further because we want to get the message out to people who have never thought that herbs are medicine because it's lovely talking to people who are interested and already have some knowledge of the plants but we're very interested in talking to people who've never ever thought that the plants that they walk past daily could have interactions with them or could become their friends. And this feels like a really accessible, silly, fun way to get the education out there. I know you have videos like that on your YouTube channel. Are these new videos that are going to be released here soon or, or is that what you're referring to? Um, this, these are live events, so they're not recorded. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, they're That's, live. Okay. Events at the festivals and at conferences that's awesome <laughs> we actually had our um coming out as um datura and chili last oh, wow. year at a festival and um we we headlined saturday night at a festival and just before wow. we went on we were just thought okay this is ridiculous and brilliant let's just go <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then awesome. uh, yeah, we won we won an award at that festival for being the second best speakers at the festival. <laughs> <laughs> We're like we'll call ourselves top three instead of second. Yeah. 
because it's that's what, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but You're um, the it first was, loser. It was really, really fun. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, learn more about all the events, the book, um, everything at SeedSisters.co.uk. One more time for your viewing pleasure, right there for the YouTube audience. Uh, yeah, beautiful book. Well, you two, it's been a lot of fun to catch up. Let's have you back on for a third time at some point. That'd be awesome. And um, thanks so much for joining us on the Herbalist Hour. Oh, My pleasure. Lovely talking to you. You as well, as always. Well, we'll see you in the next episode, y'all. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks so much for watching today's episode of the Herbalist Hour. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more great herbal content, be sure to subscribe to our Herb Rally YouTube channel. Uh, if you enjoy these Herbalist Hour episodes and you'd like to join us live, uh, you can do so by becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member. Uh, learn more at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And if you want to get your first 30 days for free, use coupon code YouTube30 at checkout. So our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members get access to exclusive video classes, monographs, and a lot more more herbal community discounts um, along with joining these live herbalist hour interviews so one more time herbrally.com slash schoolhouse enter coupon code youtube30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free all right we'll see you in the next episode and take care